South Gulf of Siam, near the equator, lies a Malayan Peninsula. Victorially, it is the garden spot of the world, but a garden over which nature has placed a sign, and that sign reads, White man, exotic shrubs and vines cling to one another with tenacious fingers to obstruct his way. Ferocious animals and slithering monsters that crawl upon their bellies. The heat, the fever, the poisonous death that lurks in the bite of one mosquito. All the dips the jungle arms herself to repel him are to the white man a challenge, incentive. He wants to unveil the secret that is so viciously safeguarded to photograph it and bring it back to his fellow men. The success of the white man depends upon the loyal cooperation of the natives. And Mr. Skink dedicates this picture to the Malayans and Siamese who were so faithful and fought shoulder to shoulder with him and who had the biggest share of the dangers. This photo play is authentic in its locale and real in its action. In its making, we owed much to his, the assistance and aid given by His Highness, the Sultan of Pera, Sir Alang Eskandar Shah, Raja Rasman, and Siamese advisor, Persat Sukhum. Highness, Sultan of Pera, FMS, Sir Alang Eskandar Shah. Mr. Harry Skink. When after weeks of preparation we were ready to start upon our journey into the jungle, His Highness the Sultan, great luck. For the first time in his life, he consented to be photographed by a motion picture camera. Miss Joan Baldwin, a British scientist, was going with us. We thanked His Highness for his courtesy and cooperation which made our expedition possible, as it was he who supplied the elephants and men. His Highness warned us of the dangers of the Malay jungles, and then in his beautiful English, bade us farewell and assured us cooperation. Captain Lindsay Veers, British Jay at the Sultan's court, an aide camp to His Highness, introduced us to Badre Tol, who are elephant trained. Badre was a college-bred boy who also acted as interpreter on our expedition. Captain Veers was the last white man to bid us goodbye with his encouraging cheerio. We felt ourselves deeply indebted to him for the aid he had given us in arranging the expedition. The little village of Chumpan Kwa, these elephants and men were specially chosen for us by the Sultan. When we arrived at this jumping off place, we found everything in readiness for departure. Ali, a native boy, was all smiles as he met her for the first time. Madame, this little convent bred girl a beauty of her race, answered to the name of me. Beware with those eyes. The servant problem solved. Badre then introduced us to our number one gunner, Captain Nan C. The best shot in the East. Our number one native. We gave the word to start. The hunt was on. Our train consisted of 50 of the best elephants in the country. These animals are the passenger. Their burdens are all human ones. Our supplies and other necessities had been started on ahead. C, who was to meet us at the main camp, which was four weeks away. Slowly the train wended its way down the road leading to the jungle, defying the man-eating tiger, the lordly wild elephant, and the deadly python lying in its path. We were going into a strange new world with strange new laws.
The main wagon train had started two weeks ahead of us and were taking the roundabout and safer route. There were 64 carts and other conveyances in this train, drawn by oxen and water buffalo. The little fellows are oxen, the long horns are the buffalo. This train followed the horsemen who were a considerable distance ahead of them. The country here was comparatively tame. The wagons averaged three to 500 pound loads. Just off this road, the jungle starts. The thoroughfare might aptly be named a highway to hell. Here is the first river crossing encountered by the wagon. The captain warned the drivers if the oxen went too low in the water to tie their heads up to the carts, also to beware of crocodiles. and they said they had sent ox carts over the safer route. In order to get safely across, the carts had to be lightened, and each cart made four or five trips across the river. This could hardly be... We still insist it wasn't such a safe route, but then maybe we're wrong. Well, they made it. Leaving the road, the elephant through the center of the jungle. Here's a jungle scout ready to pry a warning. While other busy sentinels started climbing to higher perches for better observation, a snake in the grass. But the size of the snake seemed to make no difference. We were used to Hollywood snakes, but this was the real. Notice that he will not allow the python to get a double turn on his hand. Mr. Skink gave orders to keep the python but not in his tent. Wild beasts are not the only danger have fallen victims of the fatal jungle fever. Its symptoms are somewhat like those of our influenza. Miss Baldwin was the first to be taken, and in the excitement, we didn't realize her danger. But she was too good. During the previous night, all the beaters had been sent out over a five-mile spread, ready for the signal to start the drive. Our cameras had been cleverly camouflaged behind screens of shrubbery. Other photographers had secured themselves to platforms in high trees. When the signal was given, the five-mile wide circle of beaters started to converge toward our cameras. Every animal within the circle was driven toward us. The hunt was on. It was not a hunt to kill. The gunners were instructed to use their weapons only for the defense of themselves and cameramen. With this sort of noise, no wonder the animals were on the move. Ah, another of our stars. Step by step, we made our way through to our other cameras.
the boys after a real man killer. He had killed a native and was doomed to die. It is the custom of the jungle to spear any ant that has killed a hunter. What a rug this fellow made. But wanton killing was not the object of the expedition. They did it simply to survive. We followed our native beaters, driving, constantly driving. Tiger won't climb a tree. man didn't come down. It was too good a spot for pictures. There's a python. He got a native and an inhuman struggle was on. If he could only break the hole the python had on the tree, he would be safe. He'll shake him off. There he goes. He did it. decided to move their camera to a better spot. They were building a huge screen for themselves, but there's no protection against a spot of death like this. We told best shot in the east, look, it's still breathing. If you think you're a good shot, the jury you find out, because if you miss, you'll never live to tell it. watching a cameraman prepare to get a panther. There he is, the most treacherous and hateful thing that lives. While this was going on, we kept advancing. We would have liked to have directed this scene, but nature handled it. Boy, this is going to be good. Watch. had to do it that way, the leopard was coming at him. for the captain. Short range shot, made it again. A kill worthy of any trophy room.
The captain rushed to his friend's side, but the man was badly clawed and injured and had to be removed to the rear for treatment. We almost had to establish a hospital that day. Having heard that wild elephants had been seen some miles away, we were off to see the largest herd on the peninsula. It was necessary to keep our elephant train a few miles away from the wild herd, as we were afraid they might revert to the primitive. There they are, some more of our stars. There must have been 400 wild elephants in that herd. One would imagine that they would destroy everything underfoot. Why imagine it? They do. The entire valley below us was filled with elephants, one of the rarest sights upon which a hunter can gauge. Look at that big one, Enelcads. But there were no contented cows in this stretch of God's country. There's a peninsula. This is not the stack. Given. That's too bad. It looks like this baby will be sitting on a hand or stone. Go. and covered with fleas. Oh no, not our leading man, but our... More stars. This is strictly a pre-provision picture. A ton of pythons that never came out of a bottle. Crawling masses of galvanized muscle, those most ruthless killers. They were ever present. We never knew when to swallow their victims whole, some stretching their gaping jaws to nine or ten times their normal size. They are the real jungle terror. A python out for a kill. Just one of life's tragedies as they take place in the jungle. 
and every monk in the vicinity knew that only a miracle could save him. The natives rescued the monkey before the python had a chance to crush it. It was later adopted by Mr. Skane. We arrived at our main camp to find that Captain Nancy had preceded us and, as per schedule, had everything ready for our reception. We had been traveling for two weeks, during which time we had been constantly fighting the malaria mosquitoes, which are more dangerous to human life than the tiger or leopard. This camp was in the heart of the tiger country. And it was necessary to be constantly on guard, lest leopards, tigers, and panthers devour our bullocks and Chinese ponies. Hunters were preparing for the big drive, which was to start the following day. Other native hunters were kept busy supplying no easy task as hundreds of pounds were needed weekly. From the time the trip began, this baby elephant had never left its mother's side. He was having a dickens of a time. Last one in's a so-and-so. Maybe the water was a little too cold for his oriental blood, or possibly he just felt a little modest. Come on, Ma, give a fella a push, will you? Hey, Ma. Gee, Ma, you're a lot of help. Jungle or no jungle, this fellow Dan Cupid manages to get around most everywhere. Boy and a girl, she was saying no, no, no. The still black mantle of the jungle had spread itself. Dangerous things were creeping in the gloomy shadows, but they could not affect this boy and girl. He was telling her of the cute little thatched cottage he would build for her. These two young souls brought together for the first time on this trip were finding one another. Love was being born. specimens of the deadly king cobra. These natives said they would get us some, and they did. From tree to tree they went, collecting this choice assortment of concentrated homicide. They had an uncanny control over these, the deadliest of snakes. without disturbing them. Our natives had circled around to drive them toward our cameras, which, by the way, were more effective than binoculars. As the natives in their little boats drew closer, the animals began to sense a danger and started to stampede toward the end of the valley where our cameramen were stationed.
These men were trying to break the herd up so they could get close to the individual elephants. Hey. The captain tried his hand at being a cameraman. He started out okay. Wild birds will only alight on wild elephants, shunning tame ones. Of course, the birds don't do this just for the ride, but the food they find on the elephants, the dining cars of the jungle. A white elephant, a sacred animal and very rare. This was probably the first time one had ever been photographed in his native haunts. The sight of him had a powerful religious effect upon our natives, moving all of them to fervent prayer. We had to be content with a distant view of him. We had a glimpse of the domestic life of the elephant. Their living room is knee deep in water, but you mustn't mind that. Come right in and make yourself at home. These beasts are very friendly and tame until aroused. It took nerve to do this. It's one thing to chase an elephant, but it's an altogether different matter when the elephant chases you. The boys are getting away with it for the time being, but wait. A stampede in the making. There was something in the air that spelled trouble. drive them just so far, and after that, look out, because when they get mad at you, boy, they're mad. Such unadulterated nerve. Imagine fighting Jumbo like this with a couple of spears. Now, if they were riding in an ocean liner, maybe they'd have a chance. Uh-oh, that's that. get it, he didn't want his picture taken. And there goes a $2,000 camera. And we don't blame the cameramen for leaving this lonesome looking camera behind, but we had 12 cameras on the job. Our scouts brought news of Sladangs in the offing. We immediately ordered everybody to the elephant train where the Sladang has been acknowledged by hunters to be the 100% big game animal of the world. We left the elephant country and entered the hunter's paradise, the fertile valleys that are the home of the Sladang. The name is S-L-A-D-A-N-G, Sladang. And he has the reputation of being the most unapproachable animal in existence. He is as fleet as an antelope, can conquer a tiger, and to make it perfect, he actually thinks. We only hoped we could get close enough to him to photograph him. We left our elephant train some distance from the Sladangs, as we could only approach them with the utmost stealth. We had made a 16,000 mile trip to photograph these animals, and there they were. They looked so harmless that we felt like laughing, but they too are stars in our picture. It seemed to us that it would be a simple matter to walk up to one of those cows and milk her, but then we remembered that few zoos can boast of owning a sladang, 
and it is seldom indeed that one of these animals' heads will be found in a trophy room. The beasts are too cunning for the average hunter. Of course, we're not as close to them as these pictures make us seem. It was only through the use of high-powered telescopic lenses that our cameramen were able to make these pictures, and it can be plainly seen that even at a distance, the Sladang knew something unusual was taking place. We noticed that the cows kept well in the background, while the bulls stationed themselves at the edge of the bush and kept a sharp lookout for danger. Their sense of hearing is so keen that hunters have given up in despair. Their coloring blends so well with the background, it takes a sharp-eyed hunter to see them before they see him. They were getting suspicious. It would be a mistake to think they were running away from you and to follow them out into the open country, because if you should, it would be a very good time to find out whether you are an expert marksman, but a very bad time to find out not. Sladangs are tricky. They will sham death to get you out of the bush and then attack you. After many weeks of trailing, we finally got a specimen, but the kill was so fast that our cameraman could not photograph it. Miss Baldwin was suddenly taken ill, and we were forced to call. While the cat's away, the mice will play. They didn't expect us back so soon, and were they having a big time? And were they in for a bigger one? Knowledge of medicine is necessary. She had fought off the fever as long as she could. Temperature of 104 to knock. There was only one thing to do. We must get her out of the jungle within 10 days or she would die. To return the way we came would take weeks. Badre said there was a shortcut which was extremely dangerous, as it meant crossing the Boya River. Boya means crocodile, and the river was so named because it is alive with crocs. If the river could be cleared of crocodiles, we could get Miss Baldwin across in time to save her life. The advance party was ordered to leave immediately to attempt to do this. The method employed in clearing a river of crocs is to have the natives catch as many crocodiles as possible and considerable distance up and downstream from the place at which the crossing is to be made. This attracts the other crocodiles in the river and leaves the ford sufficiently clear of them 
for a comparatively safe crossing. If anyone should ask you, monks do swim. They were after food in some trees that were surrounded by water. A little honey bear. Another star, the star villain. Little bear is going to try to beat the croc, and there they come too. They were going to hook the crocodile. And they did. The boat was being pulled by the crocodile. The intention was to get the crocs exhausted and then to take them aboard and move them downstream.
While the natives carried on an unequal battle to clear the river of its menace, the elephant train was slowly wending its way to the river. Native guards were stationed along its side, ready to repel any attacks made by animals. Miss Baldwin is an important person in the scientific world, and we were pushing forward ruthlessly to save her life. Her fever was getting worse every hour. Our biggest worry was to get the elephants across the river with as little sacrifice as possible. We found that the advance party had not succeeded in clearing the river. Captain Nancy reported many of his men disabled. It was necessary for him to have more men. We told him to take as many men as he needed but they must all volunteer and under no circumstances was he to use men with families. The response of the men was gratifying and we realized we were reaping the reward of our kind treatment of them, a treatment which they unfortunately have learned not to expect from white men. Even Ally asked to be allowed to help. He claimed to have fought crocodiles before. But Badri said no. Ali pleaded that he be allowed to do his bit in saving Miss Baldwin's life. We had grown very fond of this boy and his plea that he wanted to avenge the lives of the other boys won our consent. But of all the daring displayed on the entire expedition, none compared with that of these two boys. This was one of the greatest exhibitions of sheer nerve we have ever seen. The river is alive with crocodiles.
all the men had been rescued and given first aid. Fortunately, we had no casualties. Natives in sympathy crowded around. Death was no stranger to their eyes, but most of them had grown to like the smiling youngster and his sweetheart. To B and the captain, Allie appeared to be breathing his last. B in her anguish screamed for someone to bring the white master. B's grief was only a part of the camp's woes. The sick list was growing. It was clear that nothing short of a miracle could save him. Entirely clearing the river of the crocodiles. While one look at Miss Baldwin convinced us that we must hurry if we would save her life. Crocs or no crocs, we had to get across that river at once. Nothing else mattered now. We decided to cross on the elephants because too many of the sandpan boats had been turned over by the crocodiles. After seeing that all his people had mounted, Badre was to lead the way across while Skank in the middle was to protect the train as much as it was possible to protect it with a pistol. The other gunners were to protect the flanks with their rifles. It were to advance as the crossing could well cost the lives of several of our faithful boys. But there was no retreating now. Everyone in the train knew what to expect. It was not a job for weaklings. There was no doubt in any of our minds that the crocodiles would attack us. The elephants seemed to know it too. The opposite shore looked close, yet death was staring us in the face.
was a victory of organization over individuals. Had the crocodiles been blessed with brains, they could easily have overwhelmed us by the sheer power of numbers. A short rest away from the swamp and our patient had passed the crisis. It was decided that she had gained sufficient strength to enable her to hold out until we reached civilization again. Our biggest worry now was for the recovery of the boy Alley, whose injuries we blamed directly upon ourselves for having allowed him to join the river battle. B, with the faith of a child, had never ceased to fight and hoped for the recovery of the one she loved. It has been demonstrated time and again that faith can work miracles. In this case, it seemed almost incredible, but Alley was recovering. They are a hardy people, those that live in the jungles, and apparently it takes more than a little mauling by a crocodile to kill them. Besides, Ali didn't want to die just yet. Why, he had a date to sweetest girl on the Malayan Peninsula. Most of us owe a lot to the prayers we have said, and many of us lay our misfortunes to the prayers we have failed to say. Who shall say that this girl's simple faith in the power of the Supreme Being to take away life, to create or destroy us, was not the moving factor that brought her loved one back to her from the portals of another world. Certainly she and Ali have never doubted it and they are happier for it. Everyone was overjoyed by the boy's recovery. Natives who would unflinchingly face a tiger's charge turned their heads, ashamed of their tears. But B was not ashamed of hers. They were tears of gratitude and joy. Many weary days later, we trundled our way over hills and valleys, dodged the more strenuous country, and at last found ourselves within a few miles of the little village from which we had started. But what a changed little band we were. We had started out carefree and indifferent. We returned somewhat drawn and gray around the temples. We had penetrated to the secret heart of one of the most forbidding jungles in the world. We had fought to hand with leopards, panthers, tigers, and pythons, mingled with wild elephants, gazed upon the Sladang in its native valley, braved the heat, the jungle fever, and crossed the Boya River in spite of its thousands of hungry crocodiles. We had a few laughs and many thrills, and we had the memory of which still haunt us. And here were thatched cottages and automobiles and happy smiling people. Home was the white man, home from the jungle, and the picture hunter, home from hell. And so we bade Ali and B goodbye. They wanted to go to Hollywood, but we advised against it and suggested they marry. But everybody is happy in the thought of our safe return and thank for the favors of the Almighty who helped us through our greatest difficulties that we might survive. Thank you.